Hello gumshoes. As always, I'm going to give this a minute to make sure we have sound. I'm also doing a backup recording uh, just to cover all of our bases since I have had two videos taken down. Um, so just to cover all of our bases since I have had two videos. Okay. All right. We are good to go. So I'm going to start off uh, covering a few of these um, more explosive details. Not all of them are explosive. One in particular, the witness exclusion hearing from uh, Wednesday. I just decided I'm going to look the lion in the mouth and present my case as dispassionately as possible uh, with all the normal caveats <laughs> that I have no training in uh, law enforcement, I have no legal training, uh, but a lot of these statutes are pretty intuitive in the way that they are written. And so, and I did, you know, quite a bit of researching, just reading other analyses. I went into the cases uh, that Judge Boyce referenced. And so I'm just going to int introduce this topic with a snippet from that hearing and then we'll dive in. The matter the court wishes to address with the parties today involves the attendance of victims in the case as it relates to also the exclusionary rule I'll note that under Idaho Rule of Evidence 615, there are provisions for the exclusion of witnesses. And under Rule 615A, it states that at a party's request, the court may order witnesses excluded so they cannot hear other witnesses' testimony, or the court may do so on its own. And then it talks about who is exempt from that exclusion. Uh, the first thing that I'd like to take up is we are not yet at the case in chief or evidence being presented in the case. However, in order to have that on the record and given the nature of these proceedings, the court does find it necessary under Rule 615A to make an order at this point. So in lieu of waiting for a motion of either party, I do find it's appropriate and there's good cause to order the exclusion of witnesses under Rule of Evidence 615A. So that relates to the stage of the proceedings where witness testimony is taking place. So that would not include, for example, today's hearing. With that in mind then, counsel, the court has received a list of those people that um, are scheduled to be in attendance. And I'll just note, there's a few things I want to sort out. And some of that I'll do here in the record, on the record in this hearing. And some of these other issues will just be an administrative meeting I'm gonna have with counsel as it relates to non-legal issues such as seating arrangements. The legal issue today that the court wants to discuss is who is a statutorily or legally defined victim who would not be subject to the exclusion order that the court just entered. I'll also note that we'll submit a follow-up order under 615A that the court did order exclusion of witnesses in this case, so that's lodged into the record. Um, for counsel's information, we've looked into the definition as it relates to Idaho law of who's a victim under those definitions. It's found in Article 1, Section 22 of the Idaho Constitution. Also, the statute, Idaho Code 195306, defines victim. And then the definition is not entirely clear in the statute. So there's a couple of cases that have gone in to explain 
through case law what may be presumed to be a statutorily or legally defined victim. So the cases the court has reviewed is State v. Payne, 146 Idaho, 548, a 2008 case. There's another case, State v. Shackelford, 155 Idaho, 454, a 2013 case. So looking at the statute under Idaho Code 5306, it talks about immediate families of homicide victims or immediate families. And then it goes on to talk about people that are of a youthful age or with incapacity. So that's where the kind of gray area in the statute would be that I see as immediate families. Looking at those case laws or cases I've cited then, it discusses in particular defining what that means under 5306. It says, quote, immediate family member means spouse, children, brother, sister, mother, or father. And that definition is reiterated again in the newer case of the Shackelford case. And that was the Payne case I just read about. So I'll be the first to admit in this case, I don't necessarily completely understand all the family relations that may be in play here in terms of victims. I'll also note that the statute under 1953062 indicates that, quote, the victim may exercise any of the rights provided by this section by completing a written request on a form provided by the prosecuting attorney to the clerk of the district court. So I recognize that victims have their status as victims. And while that may be in their formality within the statute, what it would do is give the court a helpful guidance as to who the state has designated and believes properly falls within the definition of victim. We've made requests to have those forms submitted. And to my knowledge, those haven't been received yet. So what I'd like to do is just begin by inquiring of the state who you believe will be in attendance as a designated victim that fits within that statutory definition. And that way we can ensure that those that are going to testify that do not fall within statutory definition of victim don't remain in the courtroom during other testimony. Otherwise, they would likely be prohibited from being allowed to testify if they're going to be called as witnesses. OK, so let's break that down because that was a lot. But for those of you who I really include that more for transparency sake so that anyone who really wants to dig into the law, who wants to check my work, I always invite that. So so let's start with who called this hearing. So like I think most people, I assumed that this was at the behest of Lori and that Jim Archibald probably called this hearing on behalf of of Lori. But that was not the case. So right from the get go, Judge Boyce makes it clear that he is the one who called this hearing to address this issue. I will say on the front end before I get into all of the details, I will try to address these issues as as gently as possible. But I'm just going to say right from the start, I do not believe this issue is what it has been conflated to become. So I do understand that there are understandably high emotions. This also impacted me. There was an emotional element for me because there was an issue that I was trying to press the prosecutor, like the prosecution team, I should say, on that had nothing to do with this. 
but this did impact me. So, you know, so I, I'm not completely unimpacted uh, by this. This uh, potentially, you know, could have also impacted my daughter who will be joining me. We're planning on coming out for uh, opening statements. That's as much as, as we can do. And so, you know, there, there are kind of far reaching implications um, to what is being introduced here. But I will say it is, in, in my opinion, it is very important that Judge Boyce is addressing this because however this is decided, you know, who, uh, who is a statutorily defined victim. No one is saying that those of us who do not fit within the definition of a statutorily uh, defined victim aren't haven't been victimized by these crimes and um, and so and I think you'll see that the arguments between the state and the prosecution after I dug into the case law that Judge Boyce presented their arguments in my opinion were completely moot and I will I will, I will make my case and you decide for yourself, but this doesn't even come down to, you know, is Kay Woodcock a, a grandmother or an aunt? I mean, it, I, I think, I think you'll, you'll see that. I mean, ultimately this is going to come down to Judge Boyce's decision, but I looked at the case law that he presented as well as the case law presented by the Woodcock's attorney and, um, and they all come to the same conclusion, in, in my opinion, as impacts this case. So anyway, all right. So the point of this was, the, well, okay. So it started off with an exclusion of witnesses. So the court, meaning Judge Boyce, uh, entered an exclusion order and cited the Idaho Rule of Evidence 615 a and that just says either party or the court uh, can enter this exclusion order and um, and what this did was it ordered witnesses excluded from the from the courtroom during these um, trial proceedings uh, so that they can't hear other witnesses testimony until after they testify and so once they uh, have have testified, then they can enter the the courtroom. So, in Idaho, they have a, a victim exemption. So, victims are exempt from this. Now, you would think intuitively a victim would be like you know any family member, anyone who has been you know, negatively impacted um, by the crime. And uh, what Judge Boyce referenced was Idaho, Idaho Statute 1953-06, uh, specifically paragraph five. And I had actually already been looking at this and I even found online like a, a victim's guide. You know, it just... It, it laid out a lot of really helpful information about how Idaho uh, defines victims. But so we'll, we'll start with this. It says, as used in this section, a victim is an individual who suffers direct. And I, I tend to think that uh, direct is a keyword here. Um, who suffers direct or threatened physical, financial, or emotional harm as a result of the commission of a crime or juvenile uh, offense criminal offense is any charge felony um, any charged felony excuse me or a misdemeanor involving physical injury or the threat of physical injury or a I'm not going to say that word so that <laughs> nothing happens to my channel um, but um, the s word offense and so the state argued hey a victim is you know any I shouldn't say hey uh, a victim is anyone who has suffered as a result of these crimes. And the state included uh, Kay 
and in, in their list, and as we'll see, I'll I'll play that um, that snippet just so that you're not taking my word for anything. But when Rob Wood was asked to list uh, the um, the witnesses who are also statutorily uh, defined victims, he included uh, Kay Woodcock. He included me, but I am no longer going to be a, a witness. Uh, Rob Wood had asked me uh, if I would be a witness in the penalty phase in the event that Lori uh, was convicted and um, to humanize Tylee, and I had agreed to that. I didn't, I only told one person. Um, so I didn't share that just because I didn't want it to get out. Um, and, you know, in the event that like there were other family members who maybe weren't asked to, to be witnesses. So I don't say that as a flex. I'm just saying like I had no reason not to, to share that other than I just didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to take the, the chance of hurting someone else. Uh, so, all right. So where, where, all right. So that, this is how, um, the, uh, the Idaho statute defines a victim. So what this is saying in, in my thinking, in plain English, if I'm assaulted, even if others may experience emotional duress from that assault, maybe a loved one who cares for me after the assault or, you know, potentially like witnesses who witnessed the assault, like they could be traumatized. I could have family members who are traumatized, but I, under Idaho law, I would be the only victim. So Idaho provides three exceptions. One is the way they word it is a little weird, like victims of such a youthful age that, you know, yada, yada. So that sounds like children, minors, you know, and then also victims, um, they, they, they use the word incapacity. So I, I, I wanted to explain it, but I also didn't want to be responsible for like saying something that maybe um, isn't uh, the most general. So I'm just going to quote uh, the, an, another statute that like explained it a little better. I think it came from an Idaho statute, but it just said victims who are mentally incapacitated or impaired because of mental disability or disease to the extent that the person is unable to personally exercise uh, their victim rights. So children, they, they can't ex fully exercise their, um, their victim rights. Someone who's mentally uh, incapacitated or impaired. And the third exception is victims of homicide. So if the victim was, um, was a victim of homicide, because I don't, I'm kind of afraid to even use the, well, no, I'll say murder. I mean, this is, I, I'm not monetizing the channel. And I've talked about murder before, and it didn't cause any videos to be um, shut down. So victims of, if the victim was actually murdered, then the definition of victim extends to immediate family members. The problem that Judge Boyce addressed is that whereas the statute, you know, defines like, you know, the victim in kind of more general terms, it doesn't specify like what, who is considered an immediate family member. So it just says immediate family members are included, but it doesn't uh, say who, who an actual immediate family member is. And um, yeah, so that is, that's where, Judge Boyce said we need to turn to case law to determine who's considered an immediate family member. And so he listed uh, two states. I'm just going to go down the list and then I'll also talk about the state law. I mean, I'm sorry, the, the case law that the Woodcocks uh, attorney also listed. And um, we'll just take it from there. 
Okay, so the first case law was State versus Payne. Um, this was from 2008. And uh, I'll just read a couple of the, the paragraphs. I mean, this stuff gets really crunchy. So I'm not going to go into like all the backstory. We're really just, we really just care who it lists as immediate family members. So it says, in this instance, we hold that Idaho Code 1953-06, and that's the one we just looked at, limits victim impact statements to immediate family members. First, reading the entire statute makes it clear that the legislature intended to limit the definition of victim by providing that a victim must have suffered direct harm as a result of the commission of the crime. Idaho Code 1953-06, uh, 5A, uh, additionally, in the cases of homicide, it extends the right to make a statement only to immediate family members. When read together, the meaning is clear. The, leg the legislature intended to limit the right to be heard to only immediate family members. However, the legislature did not define immediate family members in this section. And, and this is where I think ultimately uh, the, the Idaho legislature needs to bake this into uh, Idaho code, um, what is it, 1953 or I think it is. Um, yeah, 1953 or Because like if governments were, or if businesses, I should say, were run like governments, like they would go bankrupt. I mean, this would be like me writing up a contract for a client, but not specifying who the client is. So I just, you know, have this contract all, all drafted and I don't specify okay, who's going to be the beneficiary of my services and who is, who's going to render payment and, and stuff. So I think it's very, very weird um, that, that even like we have to rely on case law because it's not written into the statute. So hopefully this will be rectified because even within the case law, the lists aren't, uh, they're, they're not completely aligned, but in the purpose of this case, uh, all of the lists in included uh, exclude grandparents. So, so there was this argument, are they, you know, is Kay an aunt or a grandparent? And I'll just, you know, um, I'll just bury the lead right from the, the start. Grandparents aren't included uh, in any of these lists with one exception. And I'll address that because it's not a criminal case uh, or a criminal statute. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Let's see, for instance, in Idaho Code 4, 41, 1325, immediate family member means a parent, mother-in-law, father-in-law, husband, wife, sister, brother, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, son-in-law, daughter-in-law, or a son or daughter. Idaho Code 41, 1325, two. Likewise, in Idaho Code 44, 1601, immediate family member means the spouse, children, brother, sister, mother, or father. Similarly, Blacks defines immediate family member as one, a person's parents, spouse, children, and siblings. Two, a, parent, a person's parents, spouse, children, and siblings, as well as those of the person's spouse. Okay. And the whole point of, of this, this was, um, this was a, a really critical case. Uh, and all, uh, I think all of the other cases that were listed all cite this case. So uh, Judge Boyce also included, um, let's see, what is it? Uh, I don't want to lose my, my spot in, in this paragraph. State versus uh, Shackelford. And this was from 2013. Under Idaho Code 195306, each victim of a criminal case shall be consulted by the pre-sentence investigator during the preparation of the pre-sentence report and have included in that report a statement of the impact which the defendant's criminal contact, con conduct had upon the victim. The provisions of Idaho Code 195306, you're going to be so tired of hearing Idaho Code 195306 by the end of this presentation. In State versus Payne, so this is the one we just looked at, 
This court held that Idaho Code 195306 limits victim impact statements to immediate family members. Further, the court defined immediate family members as parent, mother-in-law, father-in-law, husband, wife, sister, brother, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, son-in-law, daughter-in-law, or a son or daughter. Thus, the court held that in a homicide case, victim impact statements by those who are not immediate family members of the victim are inadmissible. Okay. So the Woodcox attorney cited two more cases. And so I just saw that this afternoon and I genuinely was like, good, good. Like, let's bring in more, more case law since that's all we have to go on. Uh, but it says here, um, I'll, I'll back it up a little bit. First, we note that both the victim's father who purchased the ticket and the brother who took the flight are victims who may claim compensation under the restriction, I mean, sorry, restitution statute. Idaho Code 195304 defines victim as the directly injured victim, which means a person or entity who suffers an economic loss or injury as a result of the defendant's criminal conduct and shall also include the immediate family of a minor and the immediate family of the actual victim in homicide cases. Both the father, the victim's father and her brother are the immediate family. Yes, that is uncontested. You know, a, a parent and a sibling, they are absolutely considered immediate family. Although the term immediate family is susceptible to varying interpretations, we conclude that both brothers and fathers fall within the core meaning of that term. For example, the Idaho Code defines immediate family in at least four places. So this case lists uh, four different Idaho Codes. And we're going to get into them. Idaho Code 155315. For the purposes of guardian ad litem statutes, immediately, I'm sorry, immediate family includes, but is not limited to spouse, parents, siblings, children, and next of kin. Idaho Code 2101C, for prison furlough purposes, immediate family is defined as a mother or father, brothers or sisters of the whole or half blood, a wife or husband or lawful issue. Idaho Code 411325, for certain insurance fraud regulations, the term immediate family member means a parent, mother-in-law, father-in-law, husband, wife, sister, brother, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, son-in-law, daughter-in-law, or son or daughter. Idaho Code 446101, for the purposes of farm labor contractor licenses, immediate family member means the spouse, children, brother, sister, mother, or father. In each case, both siblings and parents are included as immediate family. See also state versus pain. Interpreting the term immediate family for the purposes of the victim impact statement statute. Okay, so again, you know, this this case I, I went through and, you know, I just searched and, and I'll include all the links in the description so you can feel free to... Um, uh, to go through here and look to see if there's any other reference there is not. So the the case law that uh, you know unless there's like something I'm missing the case law that they reference or that their attorney references supports state versus um, pain. And then they also or I just need to stop saying they he uh, also referenced um, state versus Hansen. And, um, and in this case, um, this also supports state versus pain, but it doesn't include uh, any list of eligible family members. So, um, so I, I did a search for immediate, you know, brother, sister, mother, father, parent, sibling, you know, all of the, um, all of what you would expect to see, and it, it doesn't list them. Um, but it says here on appeal, Hansen contends the district court erred in allowing the victim's father to make a statement at sentencing because the father did not qualify as a victim pursuant to section 195306.5. We already looked at that. 
nor were circumstances present allowing for the involvement of immediate family members pursuant to, you know, yada, yada. So it just, uh, it does list the Idaho Supreme Court's interpretation of section 1953-06 in state versus pain. Um, it makes clear that the state's interpretation of the statute in this case is incorrect as the court found the statute does in fact limit the parties allowed to submit victim impact statements at sentencing. So in this case, I, th I think with this particular case, the the victim wasn't a victim of a, a homicide. And so the uh, I believe the defense had said, hey, the, the dad doesn't, the father doesn't get to make a victim impact statement because he wasn't a victim. And the judge allowed it. And um, the I think this went to the Idaho Supreme Court. And I, I believe, I mean, I've been so steeped in um, case law today, but I believe this was the case where the Idaho Supreme Court said, okay, the, the judge was out of bounds in allowing the victim impact statement, but the, they were confident that uh, the sentencing was based on the evidence and not the inflammatory impact um, victim impact statement. So, um, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm eager to see what um, Judge Boyce rules. And also, both the state and the defense were given until 5 p.m. today to submit briefings. So I'm sure they will also uh, reference uh, case law. So we'll see, we'll, we'll see how this goes. So I did find a one... Um, I, I did find uh, one statute that included grandparents, it, um, but it has to do with um, whoops mortgage loans. So it's it's not criminal. It's um, banks and banking. Uh, but uh, it says here immediate family members means a spouse, child, sibling, parent, grandparent, or a grandchild, and includes step parents, step children, step siblings, and adoptive relationships. So. But I, I think they would be hard pressed to use the statute because it it's not criminal. Um, so, all right. So um, now Judge Boyce actually consolidated the list, and I want to give a shout out to one of my mods, uh, Amanda, for catching this because even when I was like digging into, well, when I first started, you know, researching this, it was before I dug into the cases that um, Judge Boyce um, included, she had caught that Judge Boyce actually listed those who qualify as immediate family and, um, and, and drop that in our mod chat. And so I was like, whoa, okay, yeah, let's, let's um, start there instead of with Google. So he actually consolidated the, the list and he just said uh, immediate family was defined as spouse, children, brother, sister, mother, or father. So, I mean, when you actually dig into these different cases, you see that there's it's a little broader than that, but for the purpose of this case, it, from what I've seen and I've searched for grandparent, um, aunts, uncles, cousins, they're definitely, they're not included in any of, of the cases. So, uh, and also one other thing I'll note is that these cases, they're talking about victim impact statements, but the victim impact statement issue uses the same definition of immediate family as um, as this exclusion order. So, so you may look at this and say, okay, well, you know, what's the big deal? Like, just let them sit in. But the the problem that I think Judge Boyce has to weigh, you know, they're they're always having to um, weigh balance of harm according to my friend who's a judge, is this will then impact you know, uh, this other issue of victim impact statements downstream. And in one of these cases, and I forget which one it was, I think it might have been state versus pain. 
But the person was, the defendant was uh, sentenced to death and, uh, and uh, I think they had, I think it was like hours of victim impact statements. There were a lot of impact statements, victim impact statements. And the ruling was that uh, some of the people making the victim impact statements were not immediate family members. And the, um, the sentence, was, the death sentence was um, overruled and they had to redo the whole sentencing phase. And I read in one analysis, it took them eight years to get to that point of the sentencing. And then they had to go through the, the sentencing again. So, so there are kind of far reaching, or I should say farther reaching uh, implications of this definition of the uh, who qualifies as an immediate family member. Um, for me, it, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm definitely kind of waiting with bated breath to see what Judge Boyce rules ultimately. But at least for me, I was able to, you know, I, I'm pretty convinced I'm not going to be able to make an, a victim impact statement. And also let my daughter know what well, you know. You you're not going to be able to make an, a victim impact statement because uh, I can't imagine Judge Boyce uh, taking the risk of potentially having anything overturned on appeal. Okay, but we will see. Okay, so what rights do victims have? Um, that is covered in the Idaho. Uh, state constitution, Article 1, Section 22. So Judge Boyce references and, uh, and the different uh, statutes also reference, um, reference this Section 22. I'm not going to include, I'm not going to read all of them, but this is the key one, to be present at all criminal justice proceedings. So if you fall within the statutorily uh, uh, defined uh, definition, or you are a, we'll just say legally, legally defined uh, victim, then you are allowed to be at all criminal justice proceedings, even if you're a witness. Okay, uh, I do want to pull up um, the... I, I went through um, this, the, the, this was the filing by the, the Woodcocks um, uh, attorney. I'm not going to cover all of it. Uh, Justin Lum published it on his Facebook page. Um, I had to make it smaller because it's, um, it's, it's just lower resolution because I had to like stitch together all of the, um, all of the screenshots into a PDF. But I want to point out uh, a few things. So he said here in the argument, it is my understanding, let me just make sure this is the, the first page. Yeah. So because this isn't um, active text or their screenshots, I just have to put silly little stars. And that's just to give me a visual cue that I want to make a point here. All right, it says, it is my understanding that defense counsel objects to the presence of Larry and Kay Woodcock in the courtroom during the trial. Uh, I would um, I, I would counterbalance that. Uh, the defense, for, you know, again, just by way of reminder, this was not an initiative by Jim Archibald. This was an initiative by, uh, by the judge. Uh, and he actually spoke highly of Larry and Kay. I think he referred to them as good and decent people. Um, but his, his argument was that they don't meet the definition of immediate family. And so they shouldn't be included. Now, it seemed like he was operating under the assumption that grandparents are uh, included in the list, but you know, I've already kind of driven that point home. I don't think that they are. Um, so I'm not sure if Judge Boyce shared the, the case law that he was going to be referencing ahead of time. 
um, may, possibly not because of all of the, you know, back and forth about if she's a grandparent or an aunt. Um, in line 13 here, it also says it appears that the court is relying on state versus pain and state versus Shackleford. Uh, uh, other cases may be applicable that may be applicable are state versus McNeil and state versus Hansen. Uh, um, all, and th those were the ones that I pu pulled up. All these cases refer to the definition of immediate family as related to victim impact statements and restitution. I totally agree with him. Both of which can have impact on the defendant's sentence and financial obligations. And that is not the issue in this matter. There is no impact on the defense by the presence of the Woodcocks attending all judicial proceedings. This is just about allowing the victims of a hor horrific crime to be present in the courtroom. Um, this, I would argue again, you know, all the caveats apply just in reading through the statutes and then the case law. I, I didn't see anything that addressed how having, um, you know, family members who aren't considered immediate family members who are witnesses in the courtroom before they testified. Like there was nothing that talked about like, oh, this this could cause the defendant duress or or whatever. So I, I think that, I, I think in, in my opinion, I, I don't see that this really goes to the, the, the point of these um, statutes. Uh, and then he says, um, there is nothing about the presence of victims at a trial that would affect the defendant in any possible way. The purpose of Idaho Constitution, Section 22, we just looked at that, is to give the rights to victims. One of the most important, one of the most important one is for, vic for a victim, quote, to be present at all criminal justice proceedings, um, and, you know, again, I, I feel like this is kind of circuitous logic. Like, I feel like, you know, and I want to be fair. I mean, this is just my opinion. Um, but I, I feel like, like he's operating under the assumption that, of course, they are victims. And, uh, you know, emotionally, in every capacity, in every human capacity, they absolutely are victims. I almost wish that this statute wouldn't use the word victim because, you know, it just, it, it's, um, I don't know, it's, it's almost offensive because it's like, you know, you're, you're saying, oh, what, we're, we're not victims? I'm, I'm not a victim. Kay's not a victim. Larry's not a victim. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, there are a lot of victims who just don't meet the definition of victim because we're not immediate family members. At least that's my take on it. So I feel like he's arguing like, you know, under the assumption that of course they're victims as is defined by the, the statutes and um, anyway. Okay. Uh, so then he says, there is nothing in Idaho code or in the Idaho constitution that precludes the right of a victim to be pre present at all criminal justice proceedings. I, again, I mean, the, the same circuitous logic uh, is applied. And if they weren't witnesses, there would be no issue. Now that I am not a witness, there's, there's no issue. But I had no idea that being a witness in the, um, in the penalty phase would preclude me from being able to attend any of the trial. Like that... And I, I think that um, Rob Wood didn't put that out there for consideration because, he, as we'll see, he makes the point that in, in his understanding, uh, Summer Shiflet and I both qualify as, as victims, in, in, as immediate family members and hence victims, along with Kay. So, um, uh, all right. I think this is, yeah, I think this is the last point. Uh, he says under the secondary argument, J.J. Vallow has no immediate family. The only person who would be considered immediate family under the statute would be the defendant who is charged with murdering him or his biological grandparent. Um, 
and uh, yeah, and and that that can't. Uh, oh uh, yeah, no grandparents. You know, but again, according to my understanding, uh, they're not included as immediate family members. So I also wouldn't agree with that. I would presume the court would prefer to designate the Woodcocks as a representative from his immediate family to exercise these rights on behalf of the deceased um, J.J. Vallow. So this, again, you know, going back to how, um, how these different cases defined uh, immediate family members, J.J. has three immediate family members. He has Colby, um, Cole, and uh, I'm blanking on Zach Vallow. So Cole Vallow, Zach Vallow, and of course, Colby Ryan. So I don't, I, 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 I'm sure that this was, you know, drafted, um, you know, uh, in, not in haste, but, you know, I'm, I'm sure this attorney didn't have a lot of time to really, you know, come up to speed on this case and all of the many, uh, many nuances to it. But uh, yeah, I just, um, that's not an accurate statement. Okay, um, and let me also include, okay, um, so one other note I'll make here is going back to the Idaho Statute 1953-06, let me pull that up. Where is it? Oh yeah, 53-06. Okay, so Judge Boyce um, said something that I was like, whoa, okay, what, what is he talking about here? But thankfully, he you know, referenced, uh, I mean, he references statutes and, um, and case law in all of his decisions, which I will say that is one thing I just really appreciate about him, uh, in addition to just how dispassionate and how calm he is, but um, but he referenced uh, paragraph two, and it says here, upon the filing of a criminal complaint or a juvenile petition. So let me first define this because I had to look this up. Like, okay, well, when was the criminal complaint filed? And to my knowledge, there wasn't a criminal complaint uh, filed in this case. There was an indictment. And the indictment was filed on May 24th. Uh, ew. It, it, the date here is the 25th, but it was like announced, I guess you will say. Anyway, May 2021. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Upon the filing of a criminal complaint, so May 2021, or a juvenile petition, the prosecuting attorney shall inform the victim of the various opportunities provided by this section. In other words, what their rights are. And this also lists the, the rights. They're just in a different order than they're listed in the Constitution, but they're all the, the same rights. Um, so the prosecuting attorney shall inform the victim of the various opportunities uh, provided by this section. The victim may exercise any of the rights provided by this section by completing a written request on a form provided by the prosecuting attorney to the clerk of the district court. The clerk thereafter shall notify the appropriate authorities of the victim's request. Notice thereafter shall be given to the victim at the address provided unless the victim subsequently provides a different address. The victim's address shall be kept confidential by the court except for the carrying out of the provisions of this chapter. And so what this is saying is if a, a, a victim, again, as, defi as defined by Idaho law, so an immediate family member, wants to take advantage of any of these rights, so in other words, being... Um, uh, being permitted to be present at the criminal justice uh, proceedings, I guess, especially if they're um, uh, a witness, they were supposed to submit this form and they can do it at any point after the, the criminal complaint. So 
we've had almost two years. Now, I've never heard anything about this form, but also uh, uh, Rob Wood had told me the first time I talked to him that I didn't um, qualify as a victim uh, according to Idaho state law, but they were still going to inform me um, of like updates and stuff, which I really appreciated. But they inherited this, you know, victims list from the FBI and were, I mean, he wasn't saying that to be like rude or, you know, anything like that. He was just explaining, you know, we inherited this, this list of, of people who they don't actually qualify as um, victims according to Idaho state law. Um, and so some of this wasn't too surprising. The only thing I got caught up on was, well, you know, okay, so if I if I can be a witness, you know, why can't I make a victim impact statement? And no one said that I couldn't. They just, uh, we, we didn't get, uh, my daughter and I didn't get an answer on it. And, um, but anyway, so, um, so there's uh, apparently this form that's supposed to be filled out if someone wants to, um, to take advantage of that. And, um, and what Judge Boyce had said, it was included in the video that we um, listened to, but I'll just, um, uh, I'll just quote it. He said, the statute under 19, uh, uh, yeah, under 1953-062 indicates that a victim can exercise any of the rights listed by submitting a form provided by the prosecuting attorney. We made requests to have those forms submitted, and to my knowledge, those haven't been received yet. So the one thing that I want to, you know, just kind of ever so gently say, you know, here is that there, from my understanding and from what Judge Boyce has, has said, um, and my understanding of, you know, the, the statute, which we just read, and what Judge Boyce said, there's a protocol, you know, for um, for victims taking advantage of their their rights, you know, um, experiencing the full advantage of them. And so, I think what Judge Boyce was trying to say was, you know, like we're we're dealing with this on the eve of the the trial. And I mean, he wasn't trying to say this. And let me let me clarify. I'm making this point. We're dealing with this on the eve of the trial, but from my understanding, this could have been addressed sooner. I think because it wasn't, and um, and I think they had until last week um, to submit, um, you know, who their witnesses were going to be, and so um, so Judge Boyce was then going over that list of witnesses and decided, and in my opinion, rightly so. That this needed to be addressed, you know, before we just like got to trial, and this could have been potentially chaotic, you know. And so, um, anyway, at the end of the day, his job is to maintain order in the the courtroom and in how all all of these proceedings are managed. Because, you know, like when I think about, like you know, even. Like the, I, I think I've only been upset about one ruling, and and that was um, the the cameras in the courtroom. Um, but you know he can't go, and like he can't be motivated by you know who's upset about what. Like he he's had to make some really tough decisions, um, but a lot of these roads kind of point back to the prosecution, and I don't say that in judgment of the prosecution. I can't imagine all of the different plates that they've had to try to keep spinning, you know, just with the sheer enormity of all of the evidence and all of the, the details. Um, but I just, it is a little difficult to see people say such hateful things about Judge Boyce, just because like in, in reading through you know, these statutes and, and case law and stuff, I can see like, okay, yeah, these, you know, like this determination of who an immediate family member is like, you know, ultimately it ended up being on that, the judge who allowed people who weren't legally defined as immediate family members because he or she allowed 
um, all of these people to make these victim impact statements, then the victims had to endure an appeal and then the, um, uh, the, the, a do-over of the sentencing phase. So, and I think ultimately, but not that I know anything about any of this, but if I were in Judge Boyce's shoes, that's, that's what I would be concerned about. So, okay. Um, all right, moving ahead. Uh, I'm just going to address a few miscellaneous points from this uh, section from Rob Wood, and then we will move on. In terms of, is, is the court walking through the state's list? Um, Sorry, let me start that over. We believe that, in terms of, is, is the court wanting me to go down through the state's list? Um, we believe that Kay Woodcock is a statutory victim and Larry Woodcock is a statutory victim. Uh, Kay Woodcock is the um, biological grandmother and I guess now legal aunt of JJ Vallow. Uh, she's also. I want to stop there. I just want to make the the point out that Rob Wood was the first one who said that Kay was um, the legal aunt. Um, uh, so I think that was, that's another thing that I've I've read quite a bit. Like, you know, like I can't believe that. You know, Lori and Jim Archibald are saying that um, Kay is just the aunt, but I I think everyone kind of agrees that legally uh, she is she is the aunt, and this has nothing to do with inner family adoption. This has nothing to do with uh, certainly with the church. I've already addressed you know some of the um, I, I some of the. I don't know, conspiracy theories about Judge Boyce. I've already addressed the fact that he's not even LDS. And then people were sending me screenshots of people saying, yeah, but he might not be LDS, but, you know, he still is part of the LDS culture. And it's like, what does that even mean? You know, but anyway, so I'm just going to rewind um, that just just to make that point. J.J. Vallow, uh, she's also someone who cared for him for the I believe the first seven months of his life. Um, do, do you want me to limit this to Sorry, point? Let me back up. Of a grandmother, and oh, okay. Doc is the um, biological grandmother, and I guess now legal aunt of JJ Vallow. Uh, she's also someone who cared for him for the I believe the first seven months of his life. Um, do, do you want me to limit this to the wit people who would also be witnesses? I do. Okay. Again, I'm not so interested in giving people specific designations sure. other than to make sure we don't run afoul of so, so exclusion. People who may be witnesses on that list, Kay Woodcock, uh, potentially Larry Woodcock. Uh, we had listed Annie Cushing, but that was when it was a death penalty case. She will no longer be a witness. Um, Colby Ryan, who is the brother of JJ and Tylee. Uh, and Summer Shiflet, who is uh, the aunt of JJ and Tylee. Those are the only individuals on that list who are potential witnesses. Okay, so one thing I, I will clarify here is I'm not giving Lori a pass. I have no doubt in my mind she was absolutely enjoying this hearing. I mean, she is a malignant narcissist of mag props. Yeah. So they, I just have no, no doubt that this, um, this was sheer entertainment for her. My only point is that this wasn't, this didn't come from the, the defense. Although, uh, both judge Boyce and what I read in the statute that he referenced, um, both of those sources said that this uh, motion to um, exclude uh, exclude witnesses um, could have been brought by the prosecution, the defense, or the court. In this case, it was brought by the court. 
Okay. Uh, and so, you know, but according to my understanding, which, you know, take that with a giant grain of salt, um, the only one on that list who falls within the, um, the definition of immediate family member from the, the cases that we read um, was Colby. I've also seen people say, hey, why weren't Charles' sons included? I'm just left to assume they're, they're not going to be witnesses. If they were witnesses, they, they would have been included. And, and Rob Wood made the point, do you want me to limit the list to just witnesses? And Judge Boyce said, yeah, yes, I do. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so again, you know, just summing up, this isn't personal. No one is saying Kay and Larry aren't victims. No one is saying they don't want them in the, the courtroom, although I'm sure Lori does not want them in the courtroom. Um, and uh, I, I, I will say one other thing. I'm going to get on a little bit of a soapbox. I can understand family members being upset by this. Like I said, I was I was upset, you know, and, and it, when I'm upset, I dig. You know, and so I just started digging and digging in every spare minute I had to, because I wasn't getting answers, you know, and, and I really, I, I needed to adjust expectations, you know, for myself and then also for my daughter. And, um, and so I was actually grateful that we had now some case law I could reference because I was just like, why is this so difficult to, to, to find like okay so you're saying great victims have all these rights you know and then it's like okay but who's a victim like who you know brass tacks who is considered a, a victim in idaho law so i won't um I, w I won't drill that down anymore but i will say i can understand family members being upset however i have less patience for reporters and and attorneys who are commenting on this case roiling the pot with highly emotional and inflammatory comments to, in my opinion, generate views and interactions. You know, I just, I just think it's borderline predatory. Like cooler heads must prevail. Like family members, let us spin out. Like, you know, we have to deal with the reality of, you know, the emotional side of some of these laws and, and you know and and how opaque some of these laws are and it's it's very frustrating but you know these these reporters like this isn't keeping them up at night and they have they have an ethical responsibility to um to be the cooler heads and so that's all that's all i'll say okay all right so um oh that does that does remind me um uh, there was something I had just said. Um, uh, oh, yeah, that this isn't, this is just so I don't forget. Um, I, oh, I think it was in talking about, I'm like, uh, it, highly emotional and inflammatory comments. That's what it reminded me. Before I forget, I do want to thank um, those of you who left incredibly kind comments on a murderous heart, I do not say that to encourage people to leave incredibly kind comments on a murderous heart. But I also wanted to just explain something like, so over the weekend, I had a post on a murderous heart and in Cool Cats, just explaining that um, I was going to start banning um, much faster um, we had a week of sheer hysteria I mean, pretty horrific comments uh, at points and um, and but I felt now if they were really horrific I we would just ban them uh, but some of them were kind of borderline and and I went back and forth so much over you know like I, I don't you know I I don't want to come across like I am above, uh, you know, um, disagreement or anything like that. 
Um, and I had made a statement in one live and this stuff will drive me to distraction. I made a statement in one of my lives that we give people three strikes. After three strikes, you're out. And so I felt like tied down by that because I could feel my own internal barometer really overheating. And eventually I just had to come to a place where I, I was like, okay, I can't, I, I can't give three strikes because some of these strikes are just, and just the sheer volume of, of the strikes, even with like really patronizing comments, like, well, you know, given Annie's background, she just doesn't have like the same support um, that that the Woodcock family has. And that's why this is really just lashing out because she doesn't have like healthy ways to deal with her anger. And, you know, and and so like, you know, comments like that, I mean, and especially just coming hand over fist, we weren't able to, you know, like stay on on top of them. And, um, and so that's why... I made the post because I just felt like out of transparency in the event that someone tries to join the chat and they're like, wait a minute, you know, like, why can't I join the chat? Because if you're banned, you can still comment. No one's going to see it, but you can still comment, but you can't join the chat. And so, um, so that's why I wrote the post. It wasn't to elicit you know, kind or encouraging comments. But then with dealing with the videos being taken down, we don't know why they were taken down. Uh, they could have been reported for bullying and harassment, or it could have been, you know, the result of uh, keywords, um, you know, kind of a um, more AI type thing. We don't know. To be fair, we don't know. I have my suspicions, but we don't know. And, um, and so... Um, so anyway, so I just wanted to say, uh, it, it, some of your comments in particular, they, they were just, um, they just really touched me. But anyway, so I just wanted to make that point. All right. So moving ahead, um, there, uh, now we're, we're, we're moving beyond this, this whole issue of the, the exclusion of witnesses. On to an interesting point about phone calls and visitation recordings. So um, John Thomas made a, a point. This was, um, I think, in the hearing on, oh, I guess on March 21st. No, this is the wrong one. John Thomas. Okay, March 15th. Yeah. Um, he, well, we'll just, we'll just listen to it and then I'll, I'll talk about it. I would uh, tell the court that I did receive approximately 3,000 uh, phone calls uh, of the co-defendant. We received that on Monday uh, afternoon. We also received some... Uh, would you indicate for the record the date, Mr. Thomas, when you were... Oh, I'm sorry. Just, yes, just so that would be Monday the 12th. Make sure I'm right here. I guess. Monday, March 13th, okay, thank 2023. You. I received those um, uh, on a jump drive and we also received uh, six, uh, five uh, uh, visits, which were in uh, in custody visits with Chad Daybell. Uh, we received all those. And so uh, I believe that the state has, uh, I guess I don't really know if the state's complied completely with uh, rule 16 uh, in that regard, but I would make an offer to the court that we have received some information from the state uh, on that matter. But other than that, I, unless the court has any questions, uh, I would just uh, rest on my motion and my rebuttal. Okay, so uh, first of all, holy cow, 3,000 phone calls and five visits. And these were specifically phone calls between Lori and Chad before Chad um, was in custody himself, I would imagine, because uh, their their request to have phone conversation, I think they had, not that I think about it, I think there may have been one or two uh, phone calls between them while they were both in custody. But uh, I'm sure most, the vast majority of these phone calls um, were, uh, while Lori was in custody and 
um, Chad was free. By way of background, the court's scheduling order, which was issued in December, uh, gave a deadline for both the prosecution and the defense to submit evidence, or um, what they call discovery, to each other before February 27th. And um, Judge Boyce had this to say about these recordings that were turned over uh, according to John Thomas on March 13th. The courts considered the argument of the state as it relates to that February 27th deadline. While the order is clear, the state argues that it was led to believe that the February 27th date was in fact the deadline. In considering this argument, the court determines that the disclosures made February 27th were in fact late, but considers the state's good faith explanation and mitigation when determining whether prejudice has resulted due to the time those disclosures were made. However, the court also must consider that additional disclosures were made well after the February 27th deadline and are inexcusably late. Uh, notably, there were provided to the defense for the first time recordings of jail calls and visits, which include both statements recorded of the defendant and the co-defendant. Uh, still pending out there also are potentially new DNA results, um, but the disclosures of those 100 plus hours as it's been represented of jail phone calls of the defendant and co-defendant uh, were clearly past the deadline. Okay, so just on a, a practical note, like, yes, he, he knows that uh, these were two weeks late. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and, uh, and also, I just want to draw attention to, uh, he made the point that it was uh, 100 plus hours of jailhouse phone calls. So 3,000 you know, individual calls, um, and 6,000 minutes because, you know, a uh, hundred times 60 minutes is 6,000. Um, so that ended up being, a, an average of two minutes a call, which means they're either not talking very long or most likely Lori was bombarding Chad with calls that he didn't pick up on, um, probably because he was saving up for an attorney. But, um, but yeah, I just thought, I mean, you know, that's probably the analyst in me. I was like, wait, two minutes, a, a, a call. Like, I don't think most jails limit phone calls to two minutes. Um, so, and I did do like a little bit of research on that, but, and the, the shortest I found was 10 minutes. If another inmate is waiting to use the phone, otherwise I think it was like 50 minutes that they could talk and that was just one source but anyway um so uh and to be fair i'm going to also play lindsey blake's uh, response mm, let me let me clarify this was the same day as john thomas's um comment not uh, Judge Boyce's. So Judge Boyce commented on it about it being inexcusably late, um, six days later. Your Honor, the state would just indicate that the requested materials have been turned over. Uh, part of the issue with the requested materials is they are an ongoing issue. So they deal with recorded jail calls of a co-defendant. Um, and because of that, as long as there's additional calls being made, the state cannot fully comply because there will continue to be calls. And so as far as compliance goes, the actual recordings have been turned over. Turned over. Uh, they were indicated to be available in a prior discovery response that they were available for inspection and listening. The state initially had had some issues getting, due to the amount of them had had some issues getting those actually copied over but have made defense aware that they were available. Copies have now been provided of those calls. In addition to that, uh, the state has pointed out specific calls or information that the state is aware of contained within those calls that may be material to the case. 
either exculpatory or inculpatory. So the defense has been put on notice of those. In looking at the rebuttal, I think the defense, again, kind of goes into an argument regarding a bill of particulars and some issues with that. There are some indications made in there that the state would take issue with that we don't believe that those are factual. The state had filed our response to the defendant's motion to compel. We laid out the current case law in Idaho. I think that is the current case law with regard to substantial compliance and duties on both parties as far as discovery goes. I think there is a differing of opinion of exactly what is required pursuant to Rule 16b-2. But with all of that being said, the state has provided those discovery materials to the defense. Okay, so in summary, she was essentially saying we didn't turn it over. And I believe the defense, going on memory here, I meant to look this up, but I believe they said that the defense made this request for discovery in August 2021. If one of my mods could remind me to look that up, I will put that out on the community tab as well as in Cool Cats. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to close out of these. Actually, no, I'm sorry. You know what? I'll create a one tab. So, okay, great. I will leave them there, but I'll just pull this out. That'll be better. There are just too many tabs. It's like when I talk to clients and some of my clients will have like 50 tabs open and I can't stand to look at it. Okay, so we left off October 23rd. Now, we just finished up with some pretty difficult topics in terms of, well, the first one especially. The second one, it was still difficult for me, not that that means anything to any of you guys, just because I don't ever want to come across like I'm just like harping on the state. I still have the utmost of confidence in the prosecution team. I know like, you know, some people think I'm being a Pollyanna about that. I'm not. I just, I just have, I just have a lot of confidence that there will be convictions and, and one, because of the level of diligence, especially in Rexburg Police, Fremont County Sheriff's Office. And, but then, you know, also just the unsophistication level of these criminals. So, and I, you know, to the end, I will absolutely unequivocally, unequivocally support the prosecution. But now we're going to touch on some difficult topics in the timeline. And so I just kind of have to like close the door on these other issues and, um, and, and just kind of plow through this. I do plan to continue this series even when the trial starts. I think what I'm going to do is keep the Friday Night Live um, for going through the timeline. It will probably take at least uh, another couple of months. At some point, I probably won't keep going like into 2022, 2023, like the current. I mean, I, I think the, the story is really, the, the essence of the story is probably told by 2020. I might, I don't know. But I think I'm going to keep Friday nights um, to the to this series and then um, what I'm hoping to do is you know during the course of the trial kind of make notes and um, and do summaries of interesting points um, on Sunday afternoon and I'm leaning towards Sunday afternoon just so that some of our European friends can join us because these lives are so late and some of you are super hardcore 
and you're in here with us till like two, three o'clock in the morning, if not later, which is pretty amazing. But I want to be able to give, um, I, I, I want, sorry, one of my mods texted me. I wanted to make sure we had sound. Uh, but I wanted to, um, uh, I wanted to be able to give them the opportunity uh, to uh, attend, and that will also give me a little more of like the weekend to uh, churn through some of the stuff. So we'll see how that goes. If there's something that's really interesting, um, then I uh, will, I'll, I'll just jump on a live and address it. Okay, so October twenty third. Um, Lori saves photos taken in Hawaii to her iCloud account. You can click through to that if um, if that will make you happy. It's pretty well established. Uh, October 24th, Lori returns to Idaho from Hawaii. You know, by, uh, by way of reminder, at this point, Tammy was, Tammy uh, Daybell was allegedly murdered by this time, uh, the, the 19th. And uh, the next day, Lori scheduled her flight back and that flight um, was the, the 24th. But she stopped over in Phoenix. Um, actually, that one I will open. Um, let's see here, October 24th. October 24th, Lori travels, oh, sorry, from Phoenix to Idaho. I don't think we have the date of when she left Hawaii. I might have it somewhere. So it would have been the 23rd or the 24th. I thought it was the 24th, but she has a stopover in um, Phoenix where she meets up with Zulema, Melanie Gibb, and who I think is most likely Melanie uh, Boudreau, uh, to do a podcast. So they're just not leaving any stone, stone unturned. Uh, and, and so I'll just read this. This is Zulema, you can see here, October 23rd. They're making their plans. So Zulema says, I'll be at the temple in the morning. I hope you can meet me there. Lori, hey, do you want to go to Melanie's and do a podcast with us in the morning instead of temple? I hope you can. She will pick me up from the airport and we will be at her house by 8 a.m. And then lets her know on the plane now. Okay, so... Yeah, so this is 12.30 in the morning um, at Phoenix time, which Hawaii time. Yeah, she probably left like in the early morning uh, hour, either late, late on the 23rd or very early on the 24th. Zulema, yes, I can do that. Lori, perfect. See you there on our way now. Lori just got to Mel's and Zulema, okay, uh, still getting ready. So... Um, yeah, so they just like squeezed in a, a podcast. I make the point. And, and these points I actually, um, I covered in the first version of the live that was taken down, but I didn't get this far in the second one. So if you're like, hey, these sound familiar. Well, yeah, they are. But now the I have to go on the only live that's remaining and that's not on YouTube. That's on um, Facebook and, um, and uh, Dropbox. Okay, but clearly these ladies weren't too broken up about Tammy Daybell's death. All right, it's 24th. Lori travels from Phoenix to Idaho. We just looked at that. October 25th, a friend of Tylee receives a text from Tylee but says it didn't sound like her. You can click through to that, but this was the text that Tylee sent. Hi, missing you you guys too, dot, 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 love ya made the point that is mom texting right there <laughs> like so yeah I, i'm sure her friend was like love you like what well, what happened to you so um all right october 25th a man accesses Lori's storage unit spends 10 minutes i make the point this was most likely alex because the owner noted that a male brought stuff out of the unit in a pickup october 25th Melanie Boudreaux's Rexburg apartment was taken off the market. So um, it's, I, I, I said this, I think, in the first version of the live from last week. 
But given the timing, I wonder if Melanie just like went right to Rexburg with her. So who knows? She may have been able to sign online. and But sometime before the 28th, she flew to Rexburg. And I haven't found anything uh, that identifies that. But, um, but yeah. October 25th, again, uh, there are two Venmo transfers from Lori or Tylee to uh, Colby's account that day. And just something to note there, I, I think the, the, the limit for Venmo, it was right around $5,000 because I hit that limit one time uh, sending money to one of my kids. I don't remember why I sent that much money, but, um, uh, but anyway, so, so we don't know why there were two Venmos. There could have been a mistake. They could have hit the limit or Lori could have sent money from her account and then also sent money from Tylee's account. Obviously, at this point, Tylee had been dead for a little more than a month at this point. No, a month and a half, actually. October 26th. A man accesses Lori's storage unit, spends 11 minutes. Again, this was most likely Alex because it made the, the, the point that a male brought uh, stuff into the unit in a pickup. And I remember at one point in Cool Cats, I actually, I, I think I did a, a breakdown of like how these different trips to the storage unit um, coordinated with uh, some of these murders uh, but all right uh, October 27th uh, another Venmo transfer October 28th um, K emails uh, Chandler Police Department uh, Nathan Moffat to tell him about uh, Tammy Dayball's death so I think I think if memory serves me, Brandon had let Gilbert police know she died. I believe it was October 22nd. And at some point, we know that Brandon told Kay that Tammy had died. And I played that video uh, last, the, the last live where Kay talked about that. So we won't hit on that again. But she said, you can see here, October 28th, uh, she said, Chad Daybell, cult leader, whom Charles suspected Lori was having an affair. Just so happens his wife passed away in her sleep on 10 19, 19 in Salem, Idaho. I'll send her a bit shortly. How odd is that? I wonder if she was heavily insured. Lori had a large room at their home before she and Charles separated, which she used as a dance studio. She would record herself dancing two to three hours nightly and send vids to Daybell, which Charles discovered she was doing. The one thing I will note here is that you know, if you're one of those like really hardcore people who's following this entire series, you may recognize some of these screenshots from earlier lives. And that is just because there might be a, a note that I'm making about like, let's say Brandon gave Melanie $300,000 for a divorce settlement. Um, whereas uh, in another point in the timeline, um, like if there had been a date associated with this, you know, I'll include Alex quit his job. And so we may reference the same screenshots uh, quite a few times, you know, throughout the course of this presentation. And that's really just more from a, a practical standpoint one, you know, it, it's a pretty heavy lift to create all these screenshots, you know, document them, add them to the, the, uh, the timeline and, you know, create the, the relevant highlights and stuff. But then also they provide context, you know, so if I just pull out individual paragraphs, there's, there's no context. And also I don't get like the, I always try to make sure the date is included. Okay. So I just don't want it to come across like I'm just like harping on some details. Okay, October 28th, uh, two men who appear to be Alex and Chad are seen moving bikes and other items into the storage unit that Lori rented October 1st. They allegedly, 
I can remove the allegedly. They spend six minutes on the, the premises. And for this trip, they were bringing stuff into and out of the unit, which is just bizarre. October 28th, and you can click through to those. It's a combination of uh, screenshots and I think also maybe the the Dateline video. Yeah, the, the last one is the Dateline video, but we've already played that. October 28th, uh, Melanie signs a lease on her apartment in the same complex as Lori and Alex. That I'll click through to. Let's see, where is it here? Fremont County Sheriff's Office confirmed Melanie signed a lease on October 28th at the same apartment complex as Lori in Rexburg, Idaho. Furthermore, it was confirmed Alex also resided at the apartment complex. The apartment numbers rented between Alex, Lori, and Melanie were, and we, we already know this, I, I don't know why they're redacted. Also, October 28th, Brandon contacts Gilbert police to let them know he would be moving in with his parents in Utah for the foreseeable future. This was because of, you know, being shot at and, um, and we'll hopefully get to uh, the details of one of his friends who was interviewed. And I just listened to that interview for the first time this week. And I was just like, whoa. It was with the Yules. I think their names were um, Brandon and I can't think of her name off the top of my head, but we'll we'll get to it in a minute. Uh, but they describe just the sheer insanity that uh, Brandon was was living with. But OK, um, so Brandon contacted me to advise his children and he would be moving to Utah to stay with his parents for the foreseeable future. October 29th, we've already talked about this, so I'm not going to click through. An unidentified woman is seen playfully running through the snow and then approaching Lori's apartment. I've made the case before that I suspect that this woman is Summer Shiflet. There, um, and I, I, I would look that up. It, it, I talked about it in the live about uh, four questions that the GPS data um, answers or may answer. And this legend detail of the, um, the, the yellow SS and Summer Shiflet is the only name involved that I know of whose initials are SS. And there were just some interesting uh, notes about the yellow dot. So I tied the yellow dot reference to the legend that I had found. And um, yeah, it's it's pretty interesting. I really look forward to hearing uh, Summer's testimony. And if you want to um, dive into that, this link here, I, I also include that it starts at the 32 minute 56 second minute mark but also if you open it up like the i the last one whoops i link to that part of the video october 29th gilbert police reach out to fremont county sheriff's office and the coroner brenda died to learn more about tammy daybell's death uh, yeah i'll open that up I, uh, let's see, it's, I think it's here. I established contact with Madison County Sheriff's Office. Um, I think this should, well, they, they went back and forth trying to like f find out uh, who they were supposed to be contacting. Um, and they did not have record of Tammy and referred me to Madison County Coroner. I contacted the Madison County Coroner who also had no record for Tammy's death. I reviewed the obituary that Brandon forwarded me and called the funeral home. I was referred to the Fremont County Sheriff's Office because that agency investigated Tammy's death. I called Fremont County Sheriff Office, Sheriff's Office and requested their police report, then spoke with Coroner uh, Brenda Dye. 
Coroner Dye told me that no autopsy was performed on Tammy despite her age, 49 years old, and lack of medical history. So you can already tell they're just like, okay, that is weird. You know, um, I'm sure they were thinking she may not have had the qualifications for this job, but she certainly had the name for it. Um, but Coroner Dye asked if there was something suspicious surrounding Tammy's death. I told her I was unsure. Unsolicited, Coroner Dye uh, shared that she spoke with neighbors of the Daybell family. The neighbors referred to the Daybell family as, quote, extremely religious, and there were recent reports of people meeting to plan for a, quote, doomsday event. I contacted Detective Moffat and provided him with the updated information regarding Tammy Daybell's death. Detective Moffat said he would contact the FBI to schedule a meeting to discuss the combined investigations. I can't imagine what it must have been like to be these guys in uh, uh, investigating these deaths, just to like, continue to have the body count increment. October 29th, there was a Venmo transfer. October 30th, uh, Melanie texts Lori to tell her to call her and follows up with it's important. Right, and I just make the note that Brandon Boudreaux's uh, friend Jess said in an, inter in an interview that Melanie Gibb, Melanie Boudreaux, now Pulaski, and Alex were running surveillance on Brandon's friends and neighbors in October and even knocked on their doors. Again, if you were in the first live, you already heard this, but not if you um, uh, what were on the replay team. So I'm going to play this because I think it's important. People were really, really scared of Alex, especially after Tammy died. And Melanie and Alex and people like Melanie Gibb were watching our houses and Melanie showed up with Alex Melanie at Gibb? my friend's house. Melanie, Melanie Gibb. Pulowski. Okay, okay, thank you. Melanie Pulowski showed up with Alex. Yeah, to one of our friend's houses. She wow. was so scared that she almost packed up and left. When was that? That was in October. So, you know, now Melanie Gibb, then Melanie Pulaski, keep trying to distance themselves from this, but they contributed to the terror that these neighbors were experiencing as they weren't just trying to get information. They were like stalking these, these neighbors. And again, we'll, we'll dig into the details of uh, one of their, they weren't, neighbors um, they were friends but okay um let's see oh yeah and um let's see uh, she also said that melanie asked melanie good to knock on a neighbor's door to ask where brandon had gone and i will play that so again by way of review melanie Pulowski asked melanie gibb to run reconnaissance essentially like you know there was a reason uh, Brandon had taken off with his kids he was scared all this you know there was all this sketch activity um, but one thing to keep in mind is when you look at these dates I mean this is October 30th that they're describing this Melanie uh, Pulowski, then Boudreaux, and Alex, they flew into Phoenix on October 31st. And, um, and, and you'll see a very compressed timeline. And I'll just bury the lead here. Uh, I think Melanie Pulowski was absolutely desperate to find her kids and uh, planned on, I, I believe, committing... Uh, judicial interference in other words just taking off with her kids but i'll make my case and um and you know i mean i say you decide for yourself but it doesn't really matter what any of us think but i will pull this up we know the 
that she's got people watching us. She was trying to find Brandon. She was trying to find the kids. Um, she calls them angel warriors, people that would follow people and take pictures and send them to her um, of wherever they thought Brandon might be. She had angel warriors following Brandon, taking photos of the kids. If they were trying to find Brandon, they were following us. Trying to find Brandon. Following you to figure it out. Right. So Are these we, warriors from Rexburg or Arizona or? I don't know. And I when you say, that. you mentioned Melanie Gibb too. Are you, did you just say Melanie Gibb was watching your house? I don't know if Melanie Gibb was watching my house, but I know that she was sent to Brandon's house after the shooting. So I assume she was one of the people, but I don't know. I've never asked her. Yeah. You don't know. Why was she sent to Brandon's house after the shooting? Um, I don't remember. Did she like ring his doorbell, talk to him, or she drive by, or? She, she knocked on a neighbor's door and asked about Brandon because after the shooting, he left. We packed him up and he, he left. So I don't know if they didn't know that he wasn't staying in that house anymore or what, but he was long gone. Interesting. Somebody asked her to go for something, and we don't. Totally. Melanie agree. asked her to go, yeah, find out. Melanie so, Kowalski asked Melanie Gibb to go find out where he was. Right. Which is just outrageous. I mean, keep in mind, Melanie Gibb is the same person that investigators say things like, oh, I mean, you were just... Uh, on the outskirts, or I, I forget the word that they use, but, you know, like kind of minimally involved. And um, yeah, I mean, all the, the timeline, I believe, tells a very different story. She was very involved. Okay, October 31st, another Venmo. October 31st, law enforcement tracks down the Jeep uh, Alex allegedly drove when he shot at Brandon Boudreaux. Uh, the, they tracked it down in Rexburg. So um, the following supplement is a summary of the investigation completed by the Gilbert Police Department from October 3rd, the date after the attempted homicide of Brandon Boudreaux through October 31st, the date when the suspect's Jeep Wrangler appeared in Idaho. Like I said, I mean, I, you know, the, this entire timeline is stitched together because, you know, anytime I come across a date, it goes in the timeline. October 31st, Melanie and Alex fly from Idaho Falls to Phoenix and then pack up Melanie to move to Rexburg. Um, let's see. Flight from Idaho to Arizona, document one alleges Melanie Boudreaux applied for a U-Haul truck and said she was moving to BYU, Idaho student housing. Boarding passes with Melanie and her uncle Alex Cox's names show flight from Idaho Falls to Mesa. Private investigator caught them packing truck late at night, October 31st. I've made this point before. Oh, hey, Cindy Berg. Um, that... Uh, the, the, this was one of the points I made in my openish letter to Melanie Gibb that it just doesn't, it, it shouldn't have passed the sniff test that she would just accept that like Tylee was living on campus when according to Melanie Boudreaux, she was moving to BYU uh, Idaho student housing. And this goes back to 2020. Uh, research that I did so it's a little foggy but I think it's actually listed in B that apartment complex that is actually listed in, in BYU as married student housing could be wrong about that like I said that was a, uh, a few years ago now but yeah it was one mile up the street from BYU 
They stay with Zulema for the night. Even though Alex and Zulema would be married in less than a month, according to Zulema, she said she would sleep in her daughter's room, leaving her room for Alex and Melanie. First of all, Lori gave Zulema no notice about this. Look at the look at the time. This is uh, October 30th. Lori says, hi, beautiful. Alex and Mel may have to come there tomorrow and may need a place to stay. They could always stay at a hotel, but your house might be more protected. So of course, Mel and, I mean, Lori is just going to pull the weirdo angle of like, I mean, they could stay in a hotel. We're not being cheap, but you know, your house super protected from all of these uh, zombies and dark spirits. Zulema, always available. Very few boundaries early the, ne the next morning. Um, oh, and this was almost 11 o'clock at night. So Zulema replies um, early in the, the next morning, my room is available. I'll sleep with Kara. The Kara uh, is her daughter. Lori, you are so great. We love you. And I talked a couple lives ago about how this tendency of having a space before her exclamation marks is very on par for Lori. And she did that, <clears throat> excuse me, I think with some of the texts to Colby. So I just made the point, like, I think that that would have flagged him. But I think it was probably one of the examples of when he said, like, Tylee's text didn't sound like her. Um, that would have been one of the indicators because that that's just such a, a Lori thing. Zulema, are they here? Uh, and this was in the morning. And Lori, they fly in tonight at 5 p.m. Zulema, look at the date. It's Halloween. It's going to be a little crazy at my house, but we will manage, lol, um, Halloween night with my grandkids. So Lori is just imposing on her. I mean, you know, if her grandkids are, are young, you know, like the time that they would be arriving would be the time that she'd probably be up to her elbows in, you know, candy and grandkids and trying to make core memories and, you know, and, and Lori's, um, and, and, but Zulema says, you know, cause she's just like McFly here. Yeah. I can't wait to see them. And then Lori replied, oh yeah, forgot it was Halloween. And I made this point in another live, but give me a break. She had a seven year old and she forgot it was Halloween. And what Zulema didn't know anything like that should have been a major red flag. But of course, I mean, I shouldn't say, of course, she knew. I've already made uh, the case that she did know. Okay. And, um, and I did talk about this in another live, but I will uh, address it here just by way of reminder. As early as May, Zulema had told Lori, uh, I, I had the feeling something may happen to one of your family members. Lori excitedly replies, call me. Zulema replies, I will go in spirit. Now, but you know, the, there, there was like quite a bit of back and forth, but I really wanted to condense it to the, uh, the most relevant parts. Um, Zulema said, I will go in spirit when the bomb goes off and I'll be there to see JJ's spirit to go to the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, and then the, just all of this weirdness, I encapsulated them with invisible hidden capsules. And, you know, we've talked at, at length about this. Um, but, you know, she did say, I saw myself protecting the bodies. And Lori, I could not love you more right now. You are an amazing goddess. Multiple exclamation marks again, that, that space. She's very careless in her writing style. And, you know, here she just can't say enough wonderful things about Zulema because Zulema just told her, uh, yeah, um, have a prophecy. You have family members who are going to die. And, and Lori, you know, most people would be like, wait, what? What are you saying? Like, you know, like that would be the end of any friendship I had with someone. I mean, but and, and Lori, she cannot contain her elation. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, I already covered that. October 31st also. 
Uh, this is the approximate date the nanny texted Lori one last time about working for her. Lori never responded. This was um, from uh, Lauren Steinbrecher. And let's see. Uh, oh, yeah, it's pretty buried in here. It's in here somewhere. <laughs> Feel free to check it out. And I can't even dig into it because I'm not logged into my Twitter account. So, but that's been covered quite a bit. All right. This is the, this, this is the challenging part. And we're not even going to be able to get into the details because it, it's almost 10 o'clock. So what I'm going to do is I am going to do something. It's called clustering. Um, and this particular point, it does tie into other elements in the timeline. I hate ending on this note, but I do think it's important just to cluster, and I've done this before in other lives, to cluster similar uh, entries just to show in this case, it, it's going to demonstrate some pretty, um, uh, I've, don't know the right uh, word. I'm trying to choose my words very carefully. Mystifying. <laughs> That's the word. Um, mi mystifying contradictions in, yeah. Um, and I, I've also addressed this at different points in, in different lives, but in this live, I'm just going to go just kind of a down point by point, um, hit some of these entries um, uh, to talk about when they found out that Lori moved to Idaho. So October 31st, Rich Robertson, a private investigator hired by Brandon, uh, sees Melanie and Alex outside her home, taking her children's clothes, toys, and beds uh, to the curb. I will circle back in the next live and, um, and start on this and actually click through to the sources because there are quite a few details. Like I said, this is just going to be uh, scratch the, the surface and then we'll jump into the details. And um, let me search for, oops. It's the wrong emoji. If you haven't seen this in a live, when I do this clustering, I just use this emoji just to help me find them. Okay, so um, the relevant point here is that Brandon alerted Gilbert police of this development. Uh, no, I just said I'm not going to click through. I'm sorry, I'm very tired. Um, okay, so on the 31st, Brandon alerts Gilbert police that, hey, Mel just my, um, my private investigator who was tailing Melanie, probably using some kind of GPS mechanism to track her movement, uh, saw that she was packing up and left a bunch of stuff, um, kid stuff out on the curb. The next day, uh, Brandon's uh, private investigator uses a GPS to follow Melanie um, and Alex to Rexburg. So that is November 1st. Two days later, so they probably got to Rexburg on the 2nd. The next day after they most likely arrived in Rexburg, we don't have the exact date on when uh, they arrived, but I estimate the 2nd. Uh, K. Woodcock sends an email to Detective Moffitt letting him know that Lori, Alex, Melanie, and Tylee moved to Rexburg. Oh, okay. I, I keep doing this. <laughs> all right. Oh, we will click through um, to, uh, to all the sources next time. So, so they see that Melanie is moving her stuff out on the 31st. The next, uh, and then the... Uh, what was it? The first, um, yeah. So then the first, uh, Rich Robertson follows Melanie and Alex, uh, to Rexburg. They probably arrived the second, the third, 
Um, Kay lets Detective Moffat know that they moved to Rexburg. This is a critical point because this is really one of the main sticking points of contradictions, as you'll see in a minute. Two days later, Brandon informs Gilbert police that he recently learned Lori had moved to Rexburg. So Kay lets Chandler know uh, November 3rd. Brandon lets Gilbert know November 5th. And then November 10th, that's when Kay logged into Charles' Amazon account and finds Lori, Lori's purchases for wedding attire. We will um, dig a little bit more into that. But those are some pretty like significant uh, contradictions because here Kay had already told Detective Moffat that they moved uh, to Rexburg. And that doesn't even include the earlier contradictions that we've already covered uh, I, I, in a couple different lives where um, Kay had said in their 2020 interview that they found out sometime in September that Lori had moved to Idaho, but they just didn't have an apartment number. I already, you know, um, uh, addressed how I think that they found that out um, and um, and. September 26, Brandon told Kay that Lori moved out of state and that he found that out from his son. And um, I think, and, and I already made this point elsewhere, that I think that the overlap with Melanie's trip to Rexburg suggests that he was still tracking her. And most likely through whatever the device was that uh, showed up in Rexburg, um, I, I think first at the Walmart and then at Alex's and uh, Lori's. So this is one of the things that I really look forward. I really hope that we get more solid answers to uh, this question in the trial. So we're going to end on that note. It's not the happiest of notes. I really tried to end on um, a little happier notes, but I am just running on fumes. Uh, again, thank you for uh, joining another live. Really wish I could hang out with you in the comment section. Anytime I get to watch videos, it's just so fun to pop in there and see all of the interactions and ridiculousness. Um, but alas, uh, it's not in the cards for me for this series, but I will um, go back to like taking questions uh, most likely when I talk about the trial. So have a great night and a great weekend. And yeah, very soon we're going to start talking about trial coverage.